This is a versatile sled. You can clamp this way, or you can use the T-glide on the top to clamp this way. And if you clamp on a stop, then you can make a first cut on one side and put that fresh cut against the stop. And then you can do that repeatedly and get pieces the same length. Another thing that adds to the versatility is these threaded inserts, which allow auxiliary fences to be added. These auxiliary fences allow me to work with much longer pieces. I can put the stop block out as far as I need to cut long pieces of consistent length material. And these auxiliary fences are specifically for picture frames where you want to cut to a specific inside dimension to match the picture. So you'd set the stop block to the inside dimension, clamp it, make your first cut here, then come around to the stop block and make the second cut and that will give you the exact inside dimension that you set the stop block to on the ruler. This is also a precise in that this is 90 degree angle and that the pieces are cut at 45 and that precision comes from the way it's constructed which I'll show in the video. I found the pre-cut strip are quite loose in the slots. In addition, their edges have pretty deep saw marks. So for this time I bought a big piece and I'm going to rip it into strips. The edges here have pretty deep saw marks. So I'm going to run that over the jointer with a very light cut. And that came out really nice and smooth. I fiddled with the fence until I could cut off a hardwood strip that just fit in there snug. And that way I don't waste the material. They also fit in there snug. So I got four tight fitting runners with smooth edges out of that one piece and that piece is cheaper than buying four of the individual ones that don't fit very well. There's two schools of thought on runners whether to have one runner or two runners. An advantage of one runner is that with humidity if this board changes its dimensions a bit then things don't get jammed up. Just running a thin bead of crazy glue or super glue along here that'll hold the MDF base in place while I put the screws in and I've got the fence set so that it puts the base exactly where I want it. I've got strips of cardboard under the runners so that that lifts them up to be flush. I'm screwing in from the top because the runner material gives a better grip on the threads than the MDF does. And I'm going to use machine screws here. If you don't want to bother with tapping threads, then just use wood screws. And that snugs up nicely. So those bolts look pretty good, like IKEA furniture, and they feel very secure. The base slides smoothly and I feel no play at all in it. So I think that single runner idea was fine. Now the next step is I've got to put fences on here so the blade can cut it at 45 degrees. I've got to get the fences perfectly perpendicular and I've, I've got to get them lined up with the cut of the saw. So let's see how we'll do that. With this accurate crosscut sled I can cut a perfect 90 degree corner right here which I'll mark. And if you don't have an accurate crosscut sled, I'll provide a link below on how to make this exact one. So there's my 90 degree corner from the crosscut saw. And then I took the remainder of the piece off. These are about 45, but they don't have to be accurate. I've solved half my problem because I can rest the fences against this triangle and know that they're at 90 degrees. I've still got the problem of how to orient this perfectly. These blocks are for the triangle to rest against when we're doing the calibration. Their exact position is not important and I cut these notches in the triangle so I can clamp it to the reference blocks. Then I can do precision repeatable cuts and determine how much I need to shim and on which end. And I put a pencil line here so that I can always get the same alignment. The two cut method is pretty popular on the internet and I was looking forward to getting great success with that. And what it involves is making a first cut on a cross cut sled to get a 90 degree corner. The next cut is on the miter sled to get the angle. And then with calipers, you measure the distance of each edge, subtract them from each other, do a calculation, and that tells you how much you need to shim the uh, miter sled. But I could not get consistent results. And I think the reason is you're measuring off of a very fine edge which is problematic in itself. And then you're doing that twice and then taking a difference to get a very small number. For me, this method is just variable 
even though mathematically it's correct. So I came up with a, a more direct method that doesn't involve any measurements or calculations. I've got scraps of wood ripped to a uniform width and I'll cut one on each side of the jig. Place those pieces against a straight edge like the saw fence and see how they join up. I can see a small gap here whereas up here it's tight so that's not a perfect 45. Then try a spacer, repeat the cuts and check. And in just a few cycles you can get to a perfect joint like that. Which means that the jig is at a perfect 45 degree to the blade. And thicker pieces of scrap will reveal the error more accurately. If you want to calculate the size of the shim or the amount that the shim needs to be adjusted, then make sure these are well against the fence. Use a feeler gauge to determine that gap. And I think that's 10 thousandths of an inch. Don't go in too far. You want the gap at the end. Then divide that 10 thousandths by two. Then divide by the length of that cut, which is five inches. Then multiply by the length of this base, which is 20 inches. So we've got 10 thousandths of an inch, divide by 2, divide by 5 inches, the length of the cut, times 20 inches, the length of the base of the triangle. And that says we need a 20 thousandths of an inch shim. As for which side to place the shim on, that can be hard to think through. So I just try it on one side, do another set of trim cuts, and then repeat the test against the fence. And if that's the wrong side, then I put it on the other side. After you've done the calculation and gone with the perfect shim, it probably still won't be exactly right because it's hard to measure that 10 thou thickness precisely. So for the final tuning, it's probably easier to just slip thin pieces of paper in with the shim and repeat the test against the fence until you bring it in perfect. When the results are satisfactory, then this triangle is glued in place with the spacer still there and then the spacer can be removed. A few things to watch for when you're making these cuts is one, you don't want any dust on here because you want that to fit perfect. And so I've got a chamfer along there. Another thing that can happen is as the saw blade is hitting the material, it'll push it down just very slightly, even a couple thousandths of an inch. And you may not notice that and then that throws off your cut. So one thing that helps is having the blade a little higher so that it's coming down more rather than this way. And another thing is to make sure that this is not slippery. See on that side, that's slippery. On this side, it's got a pretty good grip. The important thing about the fence pieces is that the sides be perfectly parallel and that the corners be 90 degrees. You want 90 degree corners because sometimes you'll be cutting a piece of wood in this position and you want the blade to come up perfectly vertical. That 45 degree bevel that I just cut is so that when the frame material is put up against the fence to be cut, it can sit flush against the fence even if there's a little bit of sawdust caught in there. These threaded inserts will allow me to add auxiliary fences to the fence when needed. Got a 7 16 diameter hole and I carried that hole through as a 5 16 diameter so that the bolt doesn't bottom out inside the wood. I got these on Amazon. They're made in Germany by Rampa. Another way to install the inserts is with this tool that I bought from PowerTech, or you could even make your own. Thread the insert on the end, then you can go in directly like that, or you can make this, and then that guarantees you'll be lined up perfectly at 90 degrees. So these are ready to be attached to the base. Make absolutely sure there's no sawdust along there. And then as a double check, you shouldn't see any air gap. I've got the fences clamped to the base. It would have been easier to glue them on, but I want to be able to remove the fences in case I ever have to true them up. And so I'll just put a few screws from the bottom. I've marked the locations of the holes for the threaded inserts because I don't want to interfere with them. I'm clamping on each side of the hole before I drill it so that there's no separation of the fence and the base. When I screwed the fences to the base, I did it in a way that they're joined up with no gap so that the blade would cut a new slot. There would be zero clearance. I added this fence to hold the two halves together. I purposely made it not run out here so that a 
piece of material can reach out here. I only screwed it to the base rather than glue it because if I have a wider frame it's not going to work. So in hindsight I might have made this a deeper, it's 24 inches, I might have made it 30 or 32 inch deep. I put this little narrow fence here just to make a kind of a finish and it's kind of handy to throw a pencil in there. So I've cut a lot of miters over the years just by holding the material against the saw and it usually works but too often the saw hits the material and it imperceptibly slides a little bit down and then I only realize after that I don't have a perfect miter cut. So I've gotten more in the habit of clamping before I cut and then I know I've got security. I can put an even force on each side as I slide. If the material is being cut this way, so that's what these T-bars are for, and I made blocks that are a different dimension on each side so I can flip them around and find the side that works. Then clamp down, two if I want to be sure. And then I can cut that way. Another handy feature is a stop block. What that did is give me two pieces of exactly the same length. With these fences, I can go to a maximum distance of about 18 inches, which covers probably 90% of the frames I would do. And with these threaded inserts, it's easy to attach a fence extension. I made a scratch mark on the auxiliary fence and the main fence so that I can always line them up and that's so that the front edge here that goes against the blade will be in the right position. And on this side I've got a super long fence so my stop block can run way up there. I can clamp the frame material this way and I can also clamp it this way. If I had an unusual piece of material here that had to be on an angle, then I could make an auxiliary fence that supports it properly at that angle. For additional safety, you could screw a piece of Lexan on here to protect yourself from the blade. I haven't had a case where the blade actually comes through here, but if it did, I'd glue a block of wood in place there for safety. When you're cutting parts for a cabinet door, the critical distance is from end to end, and that's pretty easy to mark and to cut but when you're making a picture frame, the critical distance is the internal dimension because that's where the picture has to fit. Kind of a harder thing to measure and it's particularly difficult to set on the miter saw because it's hidden underneath. So what I've made is a special auxiliary fence that has an aluminum ruler bolted to it. I've got the fence clamped on for now because first I have to calibrate it by moving it to the right position so that when I put the stop block at, for example, exactly 10 inches and then make a cut, I will get a 10 inch inside dimension. This stop block has a little ridge that I glued on in order that the pressure is applied to the middle of the stop block rather than to the edge. Applied to the edge it might rock a bit. There's the stop block set to 10 inches. The piece of frame material is up against the aluminum on the underside. We now measure slightly less than 10 and 1 8 inch, so we have to take slightly less than 1 8 of an inch off of this piece. Okay, I've moved the auxiliary fence up and I've got the stop block reset to the same 10 inches. So after a couple more tries, I got this distance down to exactly 10 inches. That's a little tedious, but I'll never have to do it again because the ruler is now the reference for all future cuts. So what I have to do now is drill the holes through the auxiliary fence to line up with the threaded inserts that are in here. And what I found is that a five millimeter brad point drill fits through that threaded insert just nicely. And then with a little tap, I can make a precise center mark in the auxiliary fence so that when I drill that hole it'll line up perfectly and give me the accuracy I'm looking for. I drilled these holes exactly one quarter inch to match the quarter inch bolts with essentially no play. It's going to be a snug fit. And I can confirm that my drilling was accurate now that I've got the screws in because this cut edge is just kissing the blade that cut it when I had the clamps on. So I'm in the same position. You'll notice I've got about half an inch spacing from the blade to the metal ruler. First cut, second cut. 
That means I don't need a scale on here. And I turned it upside down just to avoid confusion. And in addition, if this scale ever wears off or gets damaged, I can swap the rulers around and I'll have a fresh one from here. So the position of this doesn't matter as much, but I'm gonna just line it up so that there's an equal amount of space there. Okay, after a couple of cuts, I got that pretty even and it's really just cosmetic. So now I can mark the bolt holes and put the holes in this fence as well. I drilled these holes 1 64th of an inch larger than a quarter inch and that makes the screws go in uh, just easier because the exact position here doesn't matter if it moves a 64th of an inch. Whereas over here I didn't want any play at all. I want to show a little problem here. When you pull the sled back it can tip up like that just because of the weight. Simple little jig. It's got an aluminum bracket, some cork and a toggle clamp. Drops on like that. And then we can come out as far as we want and there's no problem with it falling. And you can also still move right up. I'll put a link below to a video showing exactly how to make this. Dimensions, 30 inches wide, 24 inches deep. If it was deeper, then this back fence could be out here and I wouldn't have to remove it when I'm cutting wider pieces. Although I've been using it without this back fence and it hasn't really been an issue at all. So maybe this uh, 24 inch is the best dimension and just forget the back fence. And the tip of this MDF triangle is 12 inches from the back here. And then from that, all the other dimensions fall into place. Well, the length of these side pieces ends up being 21 inches. The fences I made two inches thick and two and a quarter inches high. And the base is one half inch thick MDF. And one more thing. It's a good idea to calibrate your saw so that the blade is parallel to the slot before you make the sled. I'll provide a link below on how to check whether the blade is parallel to the slot. And if it's not, you'll have to consult your owner's manual because the adjustment is different on every saw.